thank you for making time once again to focus on Africa. This week, we analyze the state of the African region. We have an incredible panel. We get your views on the issues. And as always, we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. This week on the show, we focus on the state of the Africa region. We have an incredible panel session led by Vice President of the World Bank, Makta Diop, coming to you straight from Washington, D.C. at the World Bank annual meetings. Let's take a look at the panel. Dr. Bobo Sise, Mali's Minister for Economy and Finance. Abdullah Bio Chane, Benin's Minister of State for Planning and Development. Dr. Natu Mwamba, Deputy Governor, Bank of Tanzania. Makta Diop, World Bank's Vice President for Africa. Albert Zufak, World Bank's Africa Region Chief Economist. We are tweeting, we are Facebooking, we are Instagramming so that we can incorporate millions of others who are not in the room. The hashtag is Africa S O R. So please do share with us on your social media platforms. Um, and and let, me, let me hand over to you to begin the conversation for us this morning from the panel, uh, Minister Sisa. What should we adjust in the things that we are doing that will have real transformation on the ground? Please. If you refer to the history of Africa, the economic history of Africa, well, for the past 30 years, we've been undertaking these adjustments. We've been undertaking reforms, economic reforms, structural reforms for the past 30 years. Sometimes they lead to uh, increased budgets. It's, we've been implementing these reforms for the past 30 years. How is it that today in Africa, our economies are still, are still importing raw materials, basic uh, materials. Uh, uh, why are we still uh, really uh, facing the effects of the price of these uh, commodities? Why is it uh, that we haven't done things properly? That's the first question I'd like to ask. Uh, I don't necessarily have the answer to that question. Uh, there are proposals, there are solutions that have been put forward. Abdel talked, talked about uh, uh, FDI foreign direct investment. That's very important, I think. Now, if you look at the nature of FDI in our countries, in Africa, I don't think that uh, the type of uh, FDI really allows us to, to tackle the spiral, the impact of uh, the fluctuations, the variation in commodity prices and the impact on our economies. Now, if you take Mali, for example, there's quite a bit of FDI, especially in the mining sector, generally multinationals. Multinationals who come to Mali and they extract minerals, which are then exported without being processed locally. Now, the reality is that these, com these companies create very few jobs, and they're not integrated into our economy. There's no real uh, relationship up or downstream. Their only reason for being there is for tax purposes, really. And let me come to you now, Deputy Governor, in terms of the, the Tanzania priorities. What are those and, and what are the expected impacts of, of some of the changes that you are trying to make? Thank you. Well, um, in terms of Tanzania's priority, and uh, if I catch up on what uh, Albert has said, we are one of the countries that has re resilience. And uh, our resilience basically came from our diversification in terms of our economic activities. Mm -hmm. Tanzania is uh, highly diversified. A decade uh, or so ago, we depended on agriculture mostly. Our export earnings were about 60% from agriculture, but now we are less than 10% because we have diversified. And uh, tourism is uh, uh, one of the services that uh, increases uh, our export earnings, and then comes manufacturing, then comes gold, and then you have the traditional agricultural commodities. And uh, another thing that really made us more resilient is that um, with the oil prices declining, we being an oil importing country, it really shifted. 
we had um, our current account shrunk by 60%. So that's a really a large amount, and this comes out of the um, uh, more exports and uh, less imports. And imports come in to, uh, two ways. The first way is that the prices were low, so we imported uh, less in terms of, um, we had a, um, oil importing bill of around $4.1 billion in 2014, and it almost halved to $2.7 billion in 2016. But this does not only come from the oil prices, it also comes from our inclusion um, of gas into the energy, because we now uh, we are prospecting gas, and we do have gas, and gas is part of the uh, national grid. And it is also used by those large industries like cement and the like. They use yeah, gas for the energy. So that also reduced the importation. Um, our currency in the course of the years have depreciated and uh, up to a level where now imports of um, consumer goods that are not necessary has declined. So we have people, I mean, um, importing is more expensive. So one would import only those that are necessary. So Tanzania's resilience really came from uh, the diversification and also the macroeconomic stability. We have been very stable in our microeconomics and particularly the indicators. Inflation rate has ranged on a single digit. We are currently at 4.9%. And um, if you look at uh, uh, growth rate, economic growth for the past 10 years or so, we've been averaging 69 and uh, 2016, we're aiming for 7.2%. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Minister Chani, let me come to you now. And um, the fact that it, it, clearly we need to be much more strategic. I think the word aggressive was used there. You were referring to attracting uh, investment, but uh, generally across the board, much more strategic and, 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 and aggressive in the way that we, we deal with things. In terms of Benin, is that a direction you're going in and what are your priorities? Yes, uh, pretty much. I think uh, I'd like really to follow up on you know, these two words that you just used, uh, being strategic, but also being very bold. I think we need all of us to look at you know, the situation from two perspectives. What is it that we've done in the past that was good enough? And if I look at the last, say, 20 years, I'll say we made progress on macro stability. And I think we need to take that home and pursue that you know, steadily. The idea that you know, uh, we'll move from boom and burst when things go right, we change our policies. I don't believe that's, that's the right way to go. So strategically, we really need to continue pursuing macro stability, have the governor just said about it, that spoke about it, have the right exchange rate policy. What's wrong with that? Have the right fiscal policy, and then move to the uh, uh, structural reforms. So I think that, and if you look at the 12 countries Albert mentioned, that's the message I will take from those, you know, 12 countries. Stay with the African Leadership Dialogues. Uh, the question is, African youth are concerned about the lack of jobs and opportunities available to them. How can we increase opportunities for Africa's young people? Critical issue. Thank you very much. I would like to say two things first. And uh, I will venture in a narration, it's not mine, this is, your, this is politics. Uh, resilience is a technical work, but it's a, a word which is also has political implications. It means that you save in good time for future. And that requires that make some tough political decision of not consuming today what will protect you for tomorrow in your economy. We haven't been good at it in Africa. We have a decade of very high commodity prices and very little have been saved in public resource in, uh, 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 for governments to be able to face resilience. Big lessons of this episode of growth where we have macroeconomic stability. We did a very good job in keeping the macro fundamental in place. We didn't do a good job in terms of preparing for counter-cyclical policies because people didn't build reserve enough when the commodity prices were high enough. You, we released a report on utilities in water and electricity. As Albert said, there are very little utilities that were run. 
This is also part of a political decision to make sure that utilities are well run, because this is a foundation of services that will have the youth to be able to have startup, to have the youth to be able to have some, create some jobs, to have the youth to be able to be better be involved in the productive sector. Thank you so much, Albert. Yes, um, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> On, on, on youth employment, I think uh, we, need, we need to uh, uh, walk on two parallel tracks. The discussion we are having is the, uh, is the supply side. We need to you know, have a uh, quality education system. We need to train our youth in a way that they can be productive. But if there is no supply, if there is no demand, then even all these efforts would not uh, yield fruits. And the demand would come from attracting and nurturing firms, large firms, you know, foreign or domestic, that's one. And it's gonna come from entrepreneurship. And for these two to happen, we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to change the regulatory framework. We need to change policies. So we need to work on these two parallel tracks. And just to close, um, my experience working in Southeast Asian countries is that you know, low skill, low you know, manufacturing in the 70s in Southeast Asia didn't require that much skills. It was actually the, the, the demand pool that came and, and, and reduced unemployment in Southeast Asian countries. Women were taken out of paddy field, given three weeks of training in, in, in textile and garment companies in Penang, and they started working, they joined the labor force. So we need to work on the two parallel tracks. And this presentation was certainly about how do we make sure that demand is on, uh, that, demand, that demand side is also addressed. Thanks. Thank, thank you for that reminder. Many of us would not have expected Brexit. How many people expected Brexit to happen? One hand, two hand, okay, three, wow, okay. Many of us didn't. We have an election happening in the US soon and we have no idea what the outcome of that might be and what impact, it, what import it might have on, on, on the African continent. Can we get it together? Can we as nations, but also as the African Union, and we have some commissioners here with us, pull ourselves together and ensure we build resilience in our economies and we are able to ensure development and dignity for our people. Please, Minister. Well, I'd like to pick up on some of the comments that have been made in the room today. Indeed, the role of the private sector is crucial, I think. I think uh, that uh, countries are and taking steps to undertake reforms to improve the business environment so that we can attract uh, FDI. Once again, I think in terms of FDI, we have to look at the type of FDI. We're talking about FDI, uh, the current FDI, FDI is not being uh, focused on the manufacturing sector, and that's unfortunate. This is where we have to take steps to attract uh, companies, private investment in, man in manufacturing, as Asian countries have successfully done, and this has led to the growth that we've seen there. Vietnam, for example, we talked about that. Malaysia also. Today, some African countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia are following suit. Key issue for most African countries. Um, uh, Deputy Governor Mwamba, please, your closing comments. Thank you very much. Well, I'll, um, I think the issue of infrastructure is uh, a critical issue, and infrastructure within the country and intra regional, particularly for intra regional trade. And we are seeing currently that um, in different blocks, their infrastructural development with the assistance of the African Development Bank, of the World Bank. We all have that in the East African context. We do have five corridor distinctive of which the infrastructural development starting from the ports to the hinterland. And uh, that is one way of which I can see uh, we can move forward. Another thing that I can quickly say is financial access to finance. That is an issue on the macro level and on the micro level, but I'll focus on the micro, particularly for youth. And this I'll connect with financial inclusion. Financial inclusion 
is getting access and usage to finance by leveraging technology. And we know that the youth of today are very technological savvy. Mm -hmm. So I think that is another way where we can explore and we'll be able to attain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Minister Chani, please. Thank you. Um, my final comment will be on really the, uh, the solutions. Uh, we know the issues, we know the problems, but the, uh, the, the, uh, the message is also that we know the solutions. Uh, because we know countries that are doing well in the continent and we know they are implementing those same solutions. So I think we really don't need to go elsewhere to see what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So the issue is implementation. Second, uh, I said it earlier, let's look at really the knowledge issue, education of course, and then infrastructure. And when you say infrastructure, you have to, at the same time to respond to how do you finance the infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Albert, if I come to you so that I can come to Mokhtar last. First, let me, let, let me say um, the most important thing, and I agree with uh, uh, Senior Minister Biochani, we know what the issues are. And I think we are more and more converging on what needs to be done. Now, the question is, how do we do it and how do we prioritize? On what do we focus first? And I think we need to, uh, you know, my, my, my suggestion would be that we focus on areas that can help us very quickly unleash the productivity potential of our economies. And second, we need to really work in reducing in-country in inequalities, especially on public services. Health and education, if you take the rural-urban divide, is not good. If you take the gender divide in our country, is actually widening. We need to fix those inequalities if we are to have peace in our country. Uh, on energy, it's not an, anymore a premier problem of, of production. The private sector is pouring on IPPs, PPAs. Everybody wants to invest in, 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 in uh, energy. The problem is the off-taker, is the utilities. This is here, people in this room, who can together work and fix that. So if you fix the utilities in, in, uh, in electricity and, uh, and, and water, more electricity, I think in a very, very short future, we can have access and affordable access in energy. So there is a responsibility which lies in this room that we, we, we have. Secondly, we, we have also another responsibility which lies in this room is uh, if you want to increase the productivity of agriculture, we need to address the issue of land, land property right across the genders, across, so if you don't address it, we don't have the investment needed in agriculture. The responsibility lies here again. Third, about education, I think the, the policymaker made huge uh, effort in allocating the resources needed to education. Now, to my view, is to build a social contract so that the responsibility is shared to bring quality of education. The message I have to, to people from OECD countries, we will not continue sending our students in India, in France, in England. Come to Africa and put your campuses there. Wow. Why? We've seen uh, one of the largest growth of education business in the UK has been to put campuses in, in Asia, in Singapore, mm -hmm. in other places. Mm -hmm. So the future is to invest, to bring your institution to come and settle in Africa and try to tap that. If it doesn't, you don't do it, we will do it, Africa, mm -hmm. and it will be moving faster. So the interest of so business proposition there is come to invest in education and convince your, your, your education, higher education institution to come. Last point also to OECD countries, is that you have huge opportunity. Your, fund, your pension fund and your insurance fund have very low return on your capital market today. We need long-term capital resources as a huge opportunity to make a lot of money in Africa. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Fascinating insights there, decelerating growth expected across Africa over the next few years, but many challenges remain. It's about being focused, being smart, being innovative, 
and ensuring the well-being of the people of this continent. That should always be the priority. Right now, let's get your views on these very issues. This week, we asked you, how can Africa deal with the challenges it faces in the changing world? Martin Osiemo says, Africa should embrace modern and skill-intensive services such as financial intermediation, computer and information services, legal and technical support. My name is Sheila Asagi. I'm watching African Leadership from Nairobi. One of the ways that Africa should deal with the, the changes that is facing us by now is by converting its waste products into renewable energy. That would be the perfect way to deal with the waste that we are facing right now. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. And on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. And it's time now for Africa's Top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature countries with the best nature of competitive advantage. The aim of the research was to determine the competitive advantage of a country's companies in international markets based upon 1. Low cost, labor or natural resources to 7. Unique products and processes. This is according to the World Economic Forum. Starting us off at number 10 is Senegal with an index of 3.44 and is ranked 74 globally. Coming in at number 9 is The Gambia. The smallest country on mainland Africa is ranked 70 in the global listings with an index of 3.48. Positioned at number 8 is Namibia. Distinguished by the Namib Desert, Namibia is number 66 in the global ranking with an index of 3.5. Taking the number 7 spot is Rwanda. The land of a thousand hills attained an index of 3.6 and is ranked 65 globally. Slotted in at number 6 is South Africa. The rainbow nation garnered an index of 3.7 and is ranked 62 in the global listing. At number 5 is Kenya. Known for the heroics when it comes to athletics, Kenya is number 51 in the global ranking with an index of 3.84. Zambia takes the number 4 spot with an index of 3.87 and is ranked 49 globally. Anchored in at number 3 is Ghana. Known for its diverse wildlife, old forts and secluded beaches, Ghana attained an index of 3.9 and is ranked 47 in the global listing. Coming in at number 2 is Mauritius. The island nation in the Indian Ocean is ranked 39 globally with an index of 4.1. At number 1 this week is Seychelles with an index of 4.7 and is ranked an impressive 27 globally. And that's Africa's Top 10 this week. As always, we close the show with words of wisdom. I love the African quotes and proverbs we share with you every week. And this one is amazing. It's not what you are called but what you answer to. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.